Good morning, everyone. And good morning for those of you who are, you sleepy heads who are watching us this morning. If you uh, missed a time change and you're not really watching us right now, um, no fret because you can always watch. We do tape the services. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. At this time, she will lead us forward with the announcements. Good morning, everyone. Are there any announcements this morning? Yes, Ron. I have a few announcements. First of all, Tuesday is a council meeting at 4.30. Uh, and at that meeting, the representative from the company who's going to be putting in the new speaker system is going to be there. So if anybody has any questions to, uh, regarding the new system, jot them down, get them to a council member or something. And uh, I got the estimate for the window work. The guy took it, he took apart this window here to see what had to be done. And he got in touch with his window and screen company they're going to make new storms for it. Uh, the bottom line is the, to the total cost for all the labor and, and material and installation and everything is $37,680. We knew it wouldn't be cheap, but uh, we're going to have to have a congregational meeting in two weeks to determine if we want to go ahead with this or not. Okay. Shall I try to repeat all that? <laughs> um, there's a council meeting this Tuesday. The sound rep will be there. So if you have any questions um, for that person, if you want to get it, the questions to the council before Tuesday night. And the quote came in for the windows at $37,680, and that will require a special congregational meeting to approve. Um, I have two announcements. Uh, one is for just a reminder that today after service, We'll start a three-week Bible study, so if you'd like to stay after for that. Uh, and then Easter lilies, um, you can purchase those until March 21st. They're $12 each. Just uh, make checks out to the church and put your money in the offering plate or mail it into the church, and along with who you want in memory or honor of. Are there any other announcements? Yeah. Um, oh, I mean, you could, you, you're oh. doing a great job. You can stay up there, I'll just tell you. And the uh, Sunday after Easter, we will have a new member center. Okay. That's it. Okay. So if anybody would like to become a new member the Sunday after Easter, let Pastor Greg know. <laughs> All right, let's stand then for our call to worship. Sometimes we say that we are a people of dry bones. We are a people without hope. God says that we have been raised from our living graves, and we shall be filled with the Spirit. Sometimes we say that we are cut off from one another, and our sources of joy are dried up. God says that we shall be at home with one another, and we shall live with celebration. Sometimes we come to worship rather aimless and a bit fearful. Then God reveals wondrous works of love, and we come to know God. Please join in our opening prayer. 
mercy of God, or God of mercy, we come to you dry and lifeless, seeking your breath of life. Lead us to the place where our hopes lie buried and call us out from the tombs of despair. Call forth our faith that we may know you to be the resurrection and the life in this world and the world to come. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is The Servants of God. seated. What a privilege it is as we continue in this sacred journey, our Lenten journey. This year it seems to be going very fast. I mean, maybe it's a factor of me just getting older and saying these things, but it's just, it seems to be pretty soon we're going to be celebrating Palm Sunday and Easter. But I certainly hope it's been a sacred journey for you. It's really a time of introspection. A time when we look at ourselves, we examine our lives uh, and realize maybe, maybe, maybe what can we do better? How can we be better? How can we be more loving? And that source of love comes, of course, from one who loves us all and teaches us how to love. That gives us the freedom to confess our sins, our mistakes, knowing that we are all human, heads of heaven and feet of clay, and that, that with that freedom we can share. Uh, our confession to God. So at this time, would you please join together with me in our prayer of confession? Would you join me, please? Merciful God, what a gentle and healing balm it is to come to you with our secret thoughts and our sad discouragements and our noblest dreams and find you here to listen, to forgive, and to renew us. We confess our reluctance to understand your will and our hesitancy to act upon it. We are quick to blame others and slow to accept responsibility for ourselves. We wish for signs of your power, even while we take for granted the beauty and love with which you have surrounded us. We desire some guarantee of your favor and at the same time shudder to think about the suffering of the cross and what it pretends for us and our world. Submerge us in your spirit and grant us faith to perceive good arising from evil and to sense your immediate presence with the solitude of endless space. Amen. Would you please join me in our unison assurance of pardon? God says to us, you are my children, 
I love you. I'm proud of you. Stand firm in your renewed commitment. Know that I have forgiven you. I call you by name. You are mine. I've entered into covenant with you and will stand by you in all times and all places. Dare to live fully the life to which I have called you. Amen. take a few moments and greet each other in Christian love as best you can. Share the joy, the enthusiasm, and, and the praise that we have for God. So good morning, everybody. Good morning. Holy hugs to all of you. Peace of Christ. Good morning up there. Hiding in, up, in the, up in the corner there, Patty, Mark. reading this morning is Psalm 93. The Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is girded with strength. He, is, he has established the world. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. More majestic than the thunders of mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea, majestic on high is the Lord. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness benefits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Thank you, Sheila. Well done. Gospel lesson, and what I'm going to be talking about today is one of those kind of intriguing tests, texts that we all could, uh, I think probably it makes an interesting Bible study too, so I will incorporate some of that. 
It's about Jesus overturning the money changers at the temple. And it's John, the second chapter, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it up. And the Jesus, the Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for forty six years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And he was raised from the, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and word that Jesus had spoken. So, all of you, my children, we're all God's children, right? So I'm not trying to be paternalistic or whatever. It's insulting in some way. We're going to be talking about anger today. Righteous anger versus other kinds of anger. And we're going to differentiate a little bit what those things are. So put on your thinking caps for a minute. I'm going to ask you a question, though. Anybody here care to share? And I don't have to put it on the microphone if you don't want. What is your pet peeve? We all have them. Come on. So anybody have a pet peeve here? Yes, Sheila. People who used, who used what? Cell phones in a drive-thru? Okay. How about having, having, a, having a meal with your loved ones and you're sitting here going, oh, yeah. You could probably say using your cell phone all the time, right? Yeah. Some, but none of us are guilty of that ever, are we? Oh, no. Okay. So that's a good one. That's, that's kind of a contemporary example. Anybody else? What other kinds of pet peeves do you have? Yes. Ah, that's right. That's. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I will be. I will be better at turning out the lights myself. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, too bad they can be automatic, right? Like a smart house or a room. You know, an office where you go in and lights come on and off. So, so well, you, you know, that's always an idea if you can't get them trained. So yeah, well, glad to have you. Other other pet peeves. Yes, Anna. I think people that speed and wink in and out of traffic. So reckless drivers. Yeah. Okay. So I, I knew the driving thing was going to come in there. I didn't know who it was going to come from. <laughs> Ron, is there's a driving. Say, oh, one of my pet peeves is people who don't yield in those roundabouts. You know, who don't yield to somebody else. Oh, in those roundabouts. Yeah, it's kept right in front of you, right? Yeah. You know, that's because they don't really understand. However, if you travel to Europe especially Eastern Europe, like Ukraine, and they got these humongous roundabouts, and there are no lines on them. And everybody's entering from, like, city squares, and you, you're, you're, you're a passenger, then you, your pet peeve is more of a fear. <laughs> like, oh, please, God, I want to get home, you know? Uh, so, seriously, I was amazed. At, I said, don't you have a lot of traffic accidents with these, these, you know? So, yeah, yeah. Or people forgetting that they're there and launching their car in the air going, trying to go over it. So that's a good one. So be cut off in traffic, so we're with the cars. Anybody else? Pet peeves. Yes, Kate. Rude people. People that don't thank you when you go out of your way to help them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at, at, at one level you're angry, but the other hand, angry, you're, it's, it's hurtful, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. That's a good one. Oh, you guys are great. We won't even do a sermon. Yes, Ray. Hey, hey, dude, you're still recovering from surgery. <laughs> I'm sure they're getting a good laugh at home, too, so. Okay, uh, peace. Well, I'll have a pastor counseling session with you after we get through Bible study. I hope I'm going to say it. <laughs> all right. So, Chris, you make sure they don't exchange any blows, all right? <laughs> People will wonder, why do you guys, there's an organization that doesn't exist anymore while we're laughing here. Uh, called the Fellowship of Merry Christians. Uh, that people should we look, people say Christians should look more redeemed, in other words, more joyful. So, um, 
I, I might uh, be doing some things later on with that. So I'm not a really good jokester, though. So my humor about the mule legs is about as funny as it gets. So uh, any other pet peeves? No? All right. Okay. Well, th so the pet peeves are obviously, that's a human condition, right? So, but we're going to talk about it a different way. I'm going to tell you a story to kind of open things up with my message here after I say my little short prayer. Um, I don't think the story is true. I certainly hope it's not true. Um, but I'll get to that in a second. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? God, may the words which I'm about to utter and the privilege that I now assume be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Since we are entering base baseball season, and I know some of you are baseball fans, um, I'm going to open with sharing a story told by the late Billy Martin, former mer mercurial baseball manager, in an autobiography that he wrote called Number One. He said he and Mickey Mantle were doing a little hunting down in Texas. Mickey had a friend who would let him hunt down there on his ranch. And when they got there, Mickey told Billy to wait in the car while he went and cleared things with his friend to make sure it's okay and where can we hunt on the, on the, on the ranch there. Permission was quickly granted for them to hunt, but the owner asked Mickey to do him a favor. He had a pet mule in the barn that was going blind and had other significant health issues and was needed, was gonna die. Because now, a mule isn't like the horses you guys have, so don't, don't you know, this isn't too close to home. But it had health issues, and he didn't have the heart to put it down, put it out of its misery. So he asked Mickey to shoot the mule for him. Mickey agreed. On the way back out to the car, a plan formulated in Mantle's mind. Reaching the car, he pretended to be angry. He scowled and he slammed the car door. Billy, being as mercurial as he was, you know, his, of course, his, his temper is going up like that. It's just like snap a finger and it would be, it would be up there. And, and so Mickey replied that the owner wouldn't let him use hunt, hunt there after all. I'm so mad that, that, at that guy that I'm going to go, I'm going to go to his barn and I'm going to shoot one of his mules, said Man. He drove like a madman to the barn. Mandel, uh, Barton protested and he said, we can't do that, we can't do that. But Mickey was adamant, just watch me, he shouted. And when he got to the barn, Mandel jumped out of the car with his rifle, ran to the barn and he shot the mule, killing it and putting it out of its suffering. And when he got back to the car, he saw that Martin had also taken his gun out and smoke was curling from his barrel. What are you doing, Martin? He yelled. Martin answered, well, We'll show that son of a gun. I killed two of his cows. <laughs> I sure hope that wasn't true. In fact, I've heard this story a number of times when I was kind of researching it uh, to verify it. And some stories say three cows. So I guess that tells you something. So two, three cows. I mean, Martin was saying there's only two cows. Martin was angry, wasn't he? Consider this. Now, obviously, this probably isn't politically correct, but... but um, but I think if we all kind of just um, take it for what it's at, for what it's worth. Another story about anger and the quick tempers that people get. It was a fine spring day. A man's driving cheerfully along a country road, and suddenly from around the curve ahead, a car comes lurching toward him in his lane. He breaks hard, and as it swerves past, kind of making him upset, the woman driver screams at him, Pig! Pig! Thinking she is insulting him, Furious, he shouts back at her, Sow! Sow! <laughs> Pleased with himself at his comeback insult, he drives around the curve and runs smack into a pig. <laughs> so we jump to conclusions when we're angry, don't we, sometimes? Angry people. A lot of angry people these days. Anger has always been a part of the human condition, but in recent years it seems to have been magnified. Divisiveness, people who are, I call keyboard cowards. They're not keyboard courage, just keyboard cowards. Launching insults on social media aimed at those they don't even know. Bullying, road rage. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. Or tailgates you, honking their horns impatiently. Someone hurts you in some way and you carry that anger around, rehearsing your mind what you're gonna say to do to that person who hurt you, those real zingers. You will say to get back at them. Sometimes it's been once said by someone 
That's the only thing that keeps some people alive is the anger that they nurse, that they carry with them to keep them alive. Think about that. There are no shortages of examples and destructive consequences of anger, are there? And here in our text for today, I did a lot of research um, with regard to this particular text and its possible background, and some of it is, is speculation. Uh, but you can imagine it to be true. We find Jesus being angry, making a scene at the temple. Why? Let me flesh out the scene as best as I can for you. And then you decide whether the anger of our Lord was justified. And how is that different from that knee-jerk response kind of anger that we have? Jesus gathered with his disciples at the home of Simon of Bethany. And after a brief conference, Jesus and his disciples left for the Passover week in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem during Passover was very crowded with thousands upon thousands of, at that time, Jewish men in town for the Passover. And it was an especially chaotic scene in the temple courtyard on this day. A huge commercial traffic, kind of like you see those kiosks that, that rise up over anything, like you go to the fairs or, or something, you see all these little kiosks, it's on t-shirts and, and Pope on a rope and all that kind of stuff, you, you go to the Vatican. <coughs> But traffic had grown up in association with the services and ceremonies at the temple, at the temple worship. There was, there was a business of providing suitable animals for the various sacrifices. And although it was permissible for the worshiper to bring his or her own animal, his animal, the temple inspectors were sure to find something wrong with those animals purchased. Oh, they're not pure enough. So worshipers were advised to buy the sacrificial, special sacrificial animals at the temple stalls. Here's the rub, though. But the temple animals were ten times more expensive. And people were getting gouged and were being grossly taken advantage of. We're setting up the scene here. At one time, unscrupulous temple leaders went so far as to demand the equivalent of a value of a week's labor for a pair of doves. A week's labor for a poor person for a pair of doves that could have been sold to the poor for pennies in that day. The temple was making enormous amounts of money. Now, I, you know, I, I'm not against making money, but I am against gouging people and taking advantage of people. And I don't think I have any argument there. With most of the profits going to the ruling priestly class. But traffic of sacrificial animals was not the only way the temple was being abused. At the time, there were also fostered an extensive system of banking commercial exchange that carried on right within the temple precincts. During the Asmonean dynasty, the Hebrew people coined their own silver money, and it had become the practice to require temple dues of one half shekel and all the other temple fees to be paid with this particular Jewish coin. Now, for 10 days prior to the Passover, the money changers were allowed to set up their money exchanging booths in the courts of the temple. Jewish men came from all over, and it's estimated they would bring 20 different types of currency. There really wasn't anything uniform. All of that had to be exchanged at the temple. Like when we travel abroad, our money has to be exchanged for the currency in the country that we're in. And of course, the money changers would charge a large commission for, for making that exchange. Both the temple treasury and the temple rulers profited tremendously from these commercial, these commercial practices. It wasn't uncommon for the temple treasury to hold upward of $10 million while common people languished in poverty and continued to pay these unjust levies. Now, in the, in the midst of this noisy aggregation of money changers, merchandisers, and cattle sellers, Jesus was about to, he was about to begin his address about the heavenly kingdom. Now, it's been speculated. Can you imagine trying to do that in the midst of that kind of chaos? Money changers, people maybe bickering about the cost of this, that, and the other. Noise of animals. And Jesus is about to say something very, very important to the people of earth. It's been speculated that Jesus, is speculated, that Jesus paused silently, but thoughtfully contemplating the scene of commerce, confusion, close by. Perhaps, perhaps, we can only speculate, but I, I suspect we wouldn't have to believe too far that he might have beheld a poor Galilean man being ridiculed and jostled about the temple authorities because he didn't have the money. And this upset Jesus. A young man was driving cattle through other accounts that I have from other historical sources. 
through the outer temple courtyard. And Jesus stepped down from the teaching platform. We're giving kind of a truncated version of that. And went up to the young man, took his whip of cords, and swiftly drove the animals from the temple. Then it is said, Jesus strode over to the animal pens and proceeded to open the gates of every stall and cage to free the imprisoned animals. And because the pilgrims had come to Jerusalem, they, they were also unhappy with the corruption of the money changers. My guess is we could probably imagine if they joined in, throwing money around and, and, you know, Jesus certainly got their attention when he cleaned out the temple. And then he returned to the speaker stand and he spoke to the multitude. multitude. You have this day witnessed that what, which is written in scriptures, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. This cleansing of the temple discloses a master's attitude toward the corruption that had become associated with religion. Does that still exist today? I'm not afraid to, I'm not afraid to say absolutely it has. As well as his detestation of all forms of unfairness and profiteering at the expense of the poor. Now the difference between Jesus' anger here and most of the things which anger most people, those pet peeves that we talked about, is that his anger was truly righteous. And it had a purpose. Remember that. It had a purpose beyond himself. His anger sought not revenge. This is how I was narcissistically wounded. But that unfair, unscrupulous practices at the temple need to stop. Temple authorities, after all, were taking advantage of the poor pilgrims in order to line their already well-lined pockets. One lesson we take away from this is that there are times when it's all right to be angry. But sometimes underneath anger is something else. It may be sadness, maybe disappointment. The late Paul Harvey, and, and I'm thinking of you, Carol, I, obviously today, I mean, this, this, will, this is very risky um, to do this in a bank, um, especially these days. But, um, and I, I certainly pray this doesn't happen to you, especially, you know, next week when I'm maybe out of commission for a couple of days, and it's like, Greg, this happened. So, you know, sometimes things happen after I say them. I pray not, I pray not. It was about a robber in Ocean, uh, Oceanside, California, who strode into a branch bank, wearing a motorcycle helmet and carrying a gun. He selected a teller who appeared 50-ish, soft, had a kind face, an easy mark. He handed her a note demanding money for her life. And, and Ray, she's not a soft target, not a soft mark. The woman reached for the cash drawer. And then she looked again at the note and her eyes flashed. Her lips clenched. Oh, she was angry. She pulled the entire cash drawer out. And before he could raise his gun, he started clobbering the robber over the head with it several times. And she was scolding him. Money was flying everywhere. She continued to beat him and shout shame on him and bounce blows off his helmet until the young man, being so overwhelmed with this, you know, this barrage of being beat on the head, turned and he ran out of that bank. The police were able to catch him hiding in the bushes nearby. <laughs> then he asked, they asked the teller why she nearly gave him the money at gunpoint, uh, but then suddenly became enraged, risking her own life, and attacked him. She told him that in his note, there was a very naughty word. <laughs> Sometimes when anger is fueled by love, not vengeance, fueled by spiritual values, they can be creative and constructive. One person can make a difference, even if they're not the most dynamic and outspoken. Look at Gandhi. Although peace was his aim, it would be a mistake to assume that he wasn't angry. He was. The difference is that what his anger was about and the way in which he chose constructively to channel and make a difference with that anger. Look at Martin Luther King. He preached nonviolence, but it would be an error to assume that he wasn't angry. He was. It was love's anger that compelled Mother Teresa of Calcutta to go live among the poorest of the poor and minister to them. It was Abraham Lincoln's anger at the practice of slavery that moved him to make the decisions that he had to make as President of the United States. My closing story 
a man whose name you probably know nothing about unless you are an aviation nut or an engineer it does that uh, aeronautical aviation or you happen to work with NASA. Uh, a man named Leonard Haslam got angry watching the 6 o'clock news. Hundreds of people had just died in an airplane crash in Washington, D.C. because the plane's wings iced up, making it too heavy to fly. I certainly appreciate the de-icing because I've been on many flights. In fact, when I went to Sandy Hook, it was snowing, and they had to de-ice our plane three times before it took off. And I'm, I'm glad, you know, so we could get up in the air. <coughs> Haslam decided to make sure that that didn't happen again because of that cause. Haslam came up with a brilliant idea, and it's been modified. It was a rather simple solution, though. Everybody who studied science knows that the opposite charges attract and like charges repel. Haslam used that principle to come up with an outstanding wing de-icer. It was his anger that generated it. He wrapped a thin sheet of rubber around an airplane's wing with wire ribbons attached carrying electrical current underneath. And when he threw the switch on, the positive wires jumped away from each other, as did the negatives, breaking the ice that had frozen to the layer of rubber above them. It's like snapping a hall carpet, drawled Haslam, and watching the dust fly. His invention could pulverize ice an inch thick on the surface of the wing. I further researched this and found that they, they modified that. They don't have to put, I think, I don't remember rubber on the wings, but they have, actually have the electrical current that they run through the wings that does the same thing in modern airplanes, because this was probably 25 or 30 years ago. Yet it uses no more power than a single landing light and costs less than an airplane tire. It's so simple, lightweight, and cheap. It's nauseating, said Haslam. It may be that over the next several, several years, hundreds of lives might have been saved because Leonard Haslam got angry watching the six o'clock news and probably said to himself, we can do better than this. Righteous anger can be constructive. I'm not talking about the kind of anger that compels you to go out and shoot somebody's cows because he or she doesn't allegedly let you use their farm to hunt. Let us remember that righteous anger is not spite. It is not selfish. It is not vengeance. And it always seeks to lift up the vulnerable, the downtrodden, and the suffering. It does not insist on its own way. Where have we heard that in scripture? Righteous anger must be described as love's courage. Love's courage. In the end, it is love, only love, that has the final word. Love always responds to hate, sometimes out of anger, but it's love. And love always and in all ways will prevail over hatred, spites, and acts of vengeance. Love never ends. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for the lessons and teaching of anger. God, we're human. We get angry, sometimes more than once a day. Maybe, maybe not that often, but we still get angry as human beings. The way we've been slighted, maybe somebody just to say thank you when we open a door for them, or somebody cuts us off in traffic, or somebody's impatiently honking at us, or, or maybe some way somebody slighted us in some way. We have those pet peeves, God, we're angry. You know that. You know that, but in all things you have taught and teach us, Help us to discern those things which we should truly be angry about. And the ways in which we can marshal and focus that anger in constructive and loving ways to make a difference. Amen. This time, I'd like to ask what prayers of concern or joy would you like to lift up? And I'm going to start us off with a couple. Um, got a message from Ken Miller. Uh, Marge Miller, whose best friend Lori passed away. Uh, also, we have prayers for them, uh, for Craig, Lori's son. So uh, Marge, uh, Craig, all of you are certainly in our prayers. Continued prayers for Pastor Ed and Anna, uh, dealing as they continue to deal with the grief and loss of Tim. And certainly we have been keeping you in our prayers and will continue to do so. Any of the prayers of joy oh, and Christ in your mercy. Yeah.
prayer. Other prayers this morning. Yes, Anna. Arabella Rose, yes, Arabella. on the 11th of March. Right. That, okay, good. First, my, so my sister's first time so she's a Ah, here are prayers. Very good. Other prayers this morning. Yes, Kay. Uh, for the family, uh, <coughs> Cass and Witzke, uh, Jewel was the mother of Terry and Karen Caston that people would maybe know. Um, I was told the funeral will probably be at Phillips in West Bend, but as of yesterday, there was nothing on their website yet. Christ in your mercy. Yeah, here are prayers. Thank you, Kay. Other prayers this morning. Yes. To my friend who is a father of his friend now recently. What, what, what happened? Your, your friend's father's business burned down. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, thank you. Other prayers this morning. So, I don't need any prayers for tomorrow. I'll be fine. So, uh, prayers that I don't uh, get the uh, nursing staff in my surgery. <laughs> what's, what's that? <laughs> well, uh, but I'm going to put up there what Barbara suggested this morning. You should see the other guy. <laughs> well, well, we'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, uh, of course. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not worried. I just, uh, you know, just uh, want to get her done. You know, stuff. If you have to wait past COVID, sometimes to get this stuff done. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, are there any other prayers? Just be mindful of all the angry people out there, all the disappointed people out there, all of the um, people who have lost hope, the people who may be bitter uh, and nursing a bitterness from years and years ago, and it may be the only thing keeping them alive, that they can find peace. Those people who are so angry at themselves that they're walking civil wars. Christ in your mercy. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious God, we thank you we thank you for the awesome possibilities of privilege of coming together and worshiping you in a season of Lent as we continue to carry our own crosses on this sacred journey. You invite us to take that journey with you. You invite us to make sacrifices so that we might feel more invested in what you really call us to be and call us to do. We thank you, God, for your prayers of comfort. And we pray continued prayers of comfort, gracious God, for the Fries family and for those who are suffering loss. Prayers of guidance and direction for those who may be hurting and don't want to continue to live anymore. For those, gracious God, who try to take their lives we pray for prayers of peace and hope that they might find in their darkness that comes through you. We thank you, God, that you are our God, that we are your children, your family. And now because of that, God, we together pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples by praying ourselves. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for our never. Amen. Freely and richly has God blessed us. In some measure, it's good that we respond out of gratitude and joy and giving praise to God. So we have shared our morning offerings uh, already here at the back. This time to share a bit of that praise and joy and celebration, Mark will now share his, his music of dedication.
and always loving God, we would ask you to accept these gifts, which we, your people, offer up to you. Grant that the causes to which they are devoted be causes of love, given to your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray, we share, we live, and we love. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.